Hey guys, Pastor Jurgen here. I'm so glad you're tuning into one of our powerful messages that is guaranteed to absolutely elevate your life to another level. At Awaken, we only want to preach fresh, real, powerful to help you grow stronger in your walk with God, develop your faith so you can take more territory. I'm praying that God blesses you and enriches your soul as you listen to this amazing word from God. God bless you. Come with me in your Bibles to Luke chapter 14. The clock is ticking. If I can find my notes in Jesus' name. There it is. All right. Luke chapter 14. Yell out when you're there. Okay, only a few people. All right. Uh, New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Hold the horse while I get on. Okay, here we go. Matthew It'll come up on the screen. Matthew, sorry, Matthew, Luke, Luke chapter 14, verse 15. It says, now when one of those who sat at the table with him, with Jesus, heard these things, he said to Jesus, blessed is he who shall eat bread in the kingdom of God. Then Jesus said to him, a certain man gave a great supper and invited many. Everyone say invited. invited. A certain man gave a great supper and invited many. And he sent his servant at supper time, to say to those who were invited, come, for all things are now ready. But they all with one accord began to make excuses. The first said to him, I have bought a piece of ground and I must go and see to it. I ask you to have me excused. Another said, I bought five yoke of oxen. I'm going to test them. I ask you to have me excused. Verse 20, still another said, I have married a wife and therefore I cannot come. No explanation required. (laughs) Oh, I love it. Ah, the Bible. It knows where we live. (laughs) I've married a wife, therefore I cannot come. Okay, yeah, yeah, totally understand. (laughs) It's, oh, oh, dear Jesus. So that servant came and reported these things to his master. And the master of the house, being angry, said to his servant, go out quickly into the streets and the lanes of the city and bring in here the poor and the maimed and the lame and the blind. And the servant said, Master, it is done as you commanded and still there is room. Then the master said to the servant, go out into the highways and hedges and compel them to come in that my house may be filled that my house may be filled. For I say to you that none of those men who are invited shall taste my supper. Uh, Today I want to preach to you a message entitled Lessons from the Invited. Lessons from the Invited. And I I know that this, this, this message is usually always preached and I'd always heard it in the context of The people that were invited was the the nation of Israel. They were the ones, and because of their rejection of the Messiah, because of their rejection of God, um, that that it made the way for the Gentiles to come in. So the people who didn't have the Torah, who didn't have the vision, who didn't have, you know, could come into the kingdom, and God went into the highways and byways, and we've got to compel them to come in. We've got to bring them to come in. You know, like I know know that that's, that's the original. And I think there's, you know, there's, there's a lesson there that we can learn that these guys got so transfixed with the temporary that they missed the eternal. I think that's always a danger, isn't it? But I, I want to I kind of flip some things around because the question is, the question to me is why were these people invited? Why, why, why were they invited because the others had to be brought and the others had to be compelled. But there were people who were invited. And if all the people that were invited turned up, they wouldn't have needed to bring and they wouldn't have needed to compel. So there's three categories, those, those who were invited. To, to, to invite somebody is, requires preparation. You know, you, you know that if I'm inviting somebody over and they've got a food allergy, we're going to accommodate that. We're going to have some, you know, some gluten-free or... or you know, whatever, because, you know, we want them to have a good time. We don't want them to be invited and not be able to eat. So so we're going to, 
you know, have the chef or whoever's cooking make adjustments. So when, when you're inviting, when you're preparing a banquet, you're, you're thinking of, of table settings. You're thinking of who's going to sit where so that communication f- can flow, that, that, you know, everyone's laughing and everyone's not just enjoying great food, great wine, but enjoying great fellowship. People are having a good time. Everyone looks like they're, they're getting on. Relationships are deepened. Connections are strengthened. You, you, you're thinking through these things. You, you might be using eBright or Evide or, you know, sending out RSVPs. However, you know, it might be, you know, on a, on a beautiful piece of paper that's embossed and gold lettering, whatever, so that people feel special. That, that There was invitation. When the people rejected in the invitation, there was another level of people that came and they were the people bring, bring, go out and bring in the blind, the lame, the maimed and the poor, blind, lame, maimed and poor. These are people that had to be brought. They had to be carried. They had to be, they couldn't, they couldn't get there themselves. These are codependent people. They're, they're, they're blind. They've got no vision. So they need somebody else to, to lead them. They're, they're, they're maimed. That They've lost the ability to, to be fruitful and productive. So somebody has to help them. They're, they're, they're lame. Somebody has to carry them. Like, the, like when they carried in, in Mark chapter 2, they carry the man on the stretcher. He's, ma- he's lame. They carry him or they're poor. They can't support themselves. So somebody else has to bring them. But then there was a third level where it says, go out now into the highways and the hedges and compel them to come in. in, in so, so once, once I brought in the, the blind, the lame, the maimed, and, and the poor, there, there's still room. And so they've got to go out and compel people who maybe they're just they're strung out on drugs, they're, 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 they're vagrants, they're, but bring them in. The master's determined my house will be filled. One, one of the things that you'll, you'll find out about God is wherever God is, he fills. The Bible says he doesn't dwell in the heavens, he fills the heavens. The Bible says the angels cry to one another, holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The earth is filled with the glory of the Lord. The Bible says when the day of Pentecost had fully come, there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind and the whole house was filled. The Bible says that Jesus says to you and I be filled with the Holy Spirit. God fills our life with good things. The Bible says he doesn't just fill our cup. The Bible says he fills our cup till it overflows. Wherever the signature of God is, he fills. The signature of God is he fills. So I want to come back to what intrigues me is the first group of people. The first group of people. There are three categories in the first group that were invited. And so we're going to learn lessons from the invited. The first one is, is the man in verse 18 says, with one accord, they made excuses. Verse 18, then the first said to him, I've bought a piece of ground and I must go see to it. I ask that you have me excused. The first quality of people that are invited people that are invited, is a territory taker, a territory taker. When you hear me say invited, this is what I, how I want you to interpret the word invited. I want you to understand that there is, a, there is an anointing that flows in the kingdom. If today you are born again, if today you've received Jesus Christ, Christ has come into your heart, I want you to know there's a, there's a, there's a flow from heaven. There's an anointing from heaven. There's a, an empowering, there's a power from heaven over your life and the first expression of that power is for you to take territory is for you to take territory this man says I, I, I've just I've just secured territory I've taken land I've bought a piece of ground and I must go and see to it we're called to take territory we're called to take territory when I first moved to San Diego People told me about, you know, there's no 501c3s. You know, it's really difficult. There's no zoning for churches. It's really expensive. You know, just, just, be, just be content to rent. But we saw in 2020 that all the, all the pastors that, that rented had spent years building their congregations, years building their churches. But then all of a sudden, because they didn't own a building, because they didn't own land, because they didn't own a territory, a landlord was able to say, well, we're shutting everything. We're not letting anybody. And so co- entire congregations were decimated. Churches were decimated because they didn't own the land. They, they, they didn't own the land. Somebody else was the landlord. 
when you secure, when you take territory, you now exercise authority over that region. The Bible says that God has made us a nation of kings and priests. The word for king in Hebrew is melech. It means one who governs with authority over a jurisdiction, over a territory. One of the first things you'll find is, is that, that there's an anointing here for you to take territory. Now, what you'll also notice is buying land or buying a home is not as easy as you just turn up with your money and the check and then they give you the deed and you walk away. You'll find that there's warfare. Anybody found that there's some warfare attached to, 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 to getting... There's warfare. And the reason that there's warfare is because the devil doesn't want to yield territory. The devil doesn't want to yield territory. In the book of Job, the Bible says that the God says to, to Satan, because he kind of tacks in with all the other angels, and he's like, where have you come from? He says, I've come from the earth. Watch what he says. He says, from walking back and forth and traveling to and fro upon the earth. Now, we can think, oh, isn't that lovely? He's exercising. Important, <laughs> important. No, you've got, got to get out. You've got to keep things moving. He's not exercising. Or maybe he is exercising. He's exercising authority. Because the Bible teaches that every place the sole of your foot shall tread. The devil's saying, I'm walking back on the earth because it's mine. This is my domain. This is my domain. This is my dominion. He says to Jesus... You see all the kingdoms, all these have been delivered to me and I decide who gets what. Bow down before me and I might just throw you a piece. And Jesus is like, yeah, you think you own it? You don't own it. I've come to take it from you. I've come to wrestle it from you. If, if, you, if you went home today, if you drove home today and you, know, you went out for lunch after church and while you were having lunch with your family, you know, you're now driving home and you pull into the driveway and the kids go, mom, dad. What's Pastor Jurgen doing in the yard? And you're like, what the, the, the is that Pastor Jurgen? And I'm like, hey guys, how you doing? And you're like, what are you doing? Ah, oh, I don't like any of your plants. I'm, I'm ripping them all out and I'm replacing them with geraniums. I've just got a geranium fetish right now. Yeah, these are all gonna go. I'm gonna replace them all with geraniums. And you're like, hey, whoa, 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 we're allergic to geraniums. <laughs> uh, it's tough tough for you yeah and I'm just gonna put you're like hang on you can't you got no authority to come like we like you pastor but you can't come and just rip stuff out well why not I can do it at my house yeah because it's your house well I just assume that no we the devil the devil thinks he rules over the earth so the reason that there's such warfare and resistance over you taking territory over the church taking. Now, I know, I know the church isn't the building. The church is not the building. But I know the church isn't the building. The church is the people, but we've got to meet in a building. We've got to meet in the building. So we, we want to take, but the reason, the, and I didn't understand at the time when the Holy Spirit said, I want you to, to keep buying buildings. And the first revelation I had was I saw, I just saw all around San Diego and now obviously Salt Lake and Boise, I saw bonfires of worship. I saw that these weren't churches, they were altars. They were places where people had encounters with God. There were places of divine, divine transformation. There, there were places where the heaven, eternity connected with men with mortality and mortality yielded to eternity where, where chains were broken, where healing flowed, where people experienced salvation and deliverance. I, I, and I saw that, but what I didn't see was that every single plot that we take, every single piece of territory that we buy, we diminish that, that there's another region that the, the devil, the devil doesn't rule over there. You know who rules over here? Jesus Christ is Lord in San Marcos. And then we have three properties in Bressy Ranch and those three properties literally... Give them, oh, I shouldn't say middle finger. Literally, literally give the devil, I can't think of another word. What a backslidden pastor. I mustn't have had a quiet time this morning. Anyway, we, 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 we tell the devil to read between the lines. That's what we do. That, 
There are three buildings here in Bressy Ranch. We just took that from you. You don't have any dominion there. We're punching holes. We're punching, punching holes in every area. In El Cajon, yeah, we just took some territory from you. Oh, oh, East Lake, we just took some territory. You know, we, we, we went through all this warfare. Like Pastor Mike Yeager, who's our East Lake, East Lake campus pastor, says, oh, Pastor, and we've got all these people who live on Coronado. You know, my wife and I just feel like we need to have a Coronado campus. And I'm like, you know what? Knock yourself out. But I, I, honestly, I like Coronado. I like the Del Coronado. You know, we hire bikes and we ride around. They've got great restaurants. This side, you've got the beach. That side, you've got the harbour. You've got city views. I like Coronado. But if, if, if we didn't have a church there, I wouldn't care. I'm still going to go there. It's still kind of a fun hangout day where we bring friends from Australia and New Zealand. We take them. It's, it's fun. I, I didn't care. Anyway, he's like, but, it, but then all of a sudden, I start, people started these fake accounts on the few social media things that I'm not banned from and started <laughs> telling me how, oh, you know, we're, we're going to drive your blankety blank off the, the, the Coronado, off the island, blankety blank, awaken, you know, that cult, you're not welcome here. And then one guy, one guy spent like a lot of money to do a 40,000 mailer, uh, you know, to tell people to, to resist, awaken, and this cult's coming, and, you know, all this nasty stuff. And, and, then, and then, then, they, then they dock some of our beautiful people who, who would just live on the island. They just live on the island. They do business on the island, but they did this nasty kind of thing to, to like, hurt their business and hurt them financially. Let me tell you, nobody is as intolerant as the tolerance people, and nobody hates like the love wins people, just so you know. Just so you know. Anyway, so, so I'm like, I'm like, God, like, what, what is going on? Like, it's a sleepy little peninsula. Like, I, I don't even care, but I'm getting all this hate. Like, when we started Balboa, there was nowhere near the warfare. There was, in fact, all, all the other campuses combined wasn't like the warfare of Coronado. And then God said to me, well, you know, what's it called? I said, well, I just told you, it's Coronado. He goes, yeah, yeah, but what does it mean? He says, it means crown. It means crown. He says, the reason you're getting such hostility is because the principality, the demon that governs San Diego, you think his crown is in the high rise of the CBD, the central, you think it's downtown, but he's hidden his crown over on this little island peninsula. And he knows that when you take his crown, he's going down. So you know what we decided? We decided, oh, we ain't renting. We're going to buy a piece of property. We're going to buy a central piece of property because we're taking the crown from the devil. When we take the crown from the, when we take his crown, you watch what happens. They will call San Diego the Texas of California. They were talking, man, it's like a Bible belt. Man, everything flourishes, everything. Already, just, just as we've been doing warfare on the, already one of the, 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 the reprobate supervisors has, has come crashing down. Things are shifting in the spirit realm because we're here to take the devil's, we're here to be territory takers. Can somebody say amen? I love you. The Bible says, the Bible says that God planted a garden eastward in Eden. And there he put the man whom he had formed. God gave Adam a command in Genesis 129. He says, Adam, see, see, I've given you every herb, every plant, every fruit fruit tree bearing seed within itself. To you, it shall be for food. There was a garden in Eden. The garden butted up against wilderness. The garden was surrounded by wilderness. Surrounded by wilderness. Jesus was driven out by the Holy Spirit after his baptism into the, where he was tempted for 40 days by the, Jesus says when a demon is cast out of a man, he goes through dry and arid places seeking rest, but he finds none. The devil dwells in the wilderness. Adam's assignment in Eden was to go to the edge of the garden and take seed from the garden, plant it into the wilderness and transform wilderness, increasing the kingdom, decreasing the wilderness, decreasing the devil's territory. He was meant to continually take ground from the enemy. The reason we are buying buildings and the reason we are taking territory because our assignment from heaven in San Diego is to increase Eden, is to increase paradise, is to increase marriage, increase fidelity, is to decrease addiction, is to decrease 
hopelessness. It's to decrease poverty. It's to decrease the chains of bondage. So the first assignment, the first anointing is to take territory. Can I tell you, you don't need to move to Arkansas. You don't need to to move to Nebraska. You don't need to move out of San Diego to buy property here. You can get property here because I'm telling you, there's an anointing on you. The anointing of the kingdom. If you are born again, there's a flow. Like Dr. Matt says, you just got to just, once you start believing, you start engaging, you are meant to take territory. And can I encourage you, don't stop at one. Don't stop at one. Get a second one, get a third. Just keep punching holes in what the, oh, devil, you think you rule over San Diego? You don't rule over this region. You don't rule over this region. You don't rule over this region. I'm watching all of our people, you know, get these miracle homes and miracle breakthroughs. Do you know how that's, that's going to affect the ecology, the, the, the future voting. These are, these are the homeowners. These are the land. These are the people who are going to... The future of San Diego is, is incredible because we have sons and daughters of the Most High, godly people, virtuous people taking the territory, taking the land. We're the ones who are going to be deciding who's on the school board. You're not going to be coming in preaching your, your, your confusion and your perversion, trying to defile our young people. We want our young people raised in an environment, but they don't have to think, am I born in the wrong body when they're four, five, six, seven? Are you kidding me? Let them play sports and let them play games and let's play, let them, let them play who's got the cooties, for goodness sake. And, you know, in the playground, rather than stupid things, we're taking territory. The second one, verse 19, the second one is... Another guy comes and says, I've just bought five yoke of oxen and I'm going to test them. I ask you to have me excused. Five yoke of oxen. Five in the scripture is grace. Oxen is servant worker. Five yoke of oxen speaks of a man who has found his grace in the marketplace. Grace in the marketplace. Paul Churchwood. Paul Churchwood has been with us. It's got to be 17 years, Pablo. Coming up. What? 15 and something. 15 and change. But when, when Paul first came, I felt so bad. We, he came as a graphic designer. And we, would, we, would, we would kind of just pay him per, per job. And then one of, one of my... Uh, Finance managers kind of made a big boo-boo and then came to me and said, oh my gosh, you know, we're, we're, we're upside down, we're underwater, we're going to have to let some people go. And I'm like, well, who do we let go? Well, you know, maybe we can outsource what Paul... So, I had that, so you know, I'm always, I'm the guy that has to deliver the bullet. You know, they make them, I've got to... Because everything's my responsibility. So I had to sit with poor old Pablo and say, Pablo, man, I'm so sorry. Oh my gosh, we've made a big boo-boo. I, I'm not sure. And he was magnificent. He was like, you know what, Pastor Jürgen, you know, whatever. He's like, I thought he was going to, he didn't, he was kind. And, uh, and then, then I find out that they made a boo-boo about the boo-boo. And they're like, oh my gosh. And then, and then they said to me, they said, you know, did you know that we just had Paul work for an entire year? And if we add up everything that we paid him, we paid him only like $18,000. And I'm like, how does a young pup live? And I, he, had, he had an eye for the young lady next to him. He was trying to, uh, he was trying all these tricks. He was trying all his moves. He had the little blue steel look all the time. It was like, it was just deadly, deadly. And so we thought, let's just, let's, just comp- let's just put him on staff, put him on salary. But what I love about Paul is he, 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 he gives a pound of flesh. Like we have the best media, the best marketing because of Paul Churchwood. But Paul, Paul also has a business that he runs outside of the church, a personal business that God has been able to bless so that he's able to, to look after his wife, his three beautiful girls, buy a beautiful home. Paul, Paul, Paul is not just a boss in the kingdom. He's a boss in the marketplace. Dr. Matt is not just a boss in the kingdom. He's a boss in the marketplace. Pastor Alex is not just a boss in the kingdom. He's a boss in the marketplace. Mike Finn is not just a boss in the kingdom. He's a boss. Why is that? Because 99% of ministry happens in the marketplace. Pastor Colin Higginbottom, they're having their second service. They started last week. Church launched 600 people. Who launches with 600 people? Second services today. He went out on, out on an altar call, you know, 20-something years ago because he heard that if you want to serve God, there are one of two options. You can either be a missionary or you can be a pastor. And he thought, man, missionary 
what if God sends me to outer Mongolia or Siberia? You know what? I think, I think if that's the only two options and I want to serve God, I, I, I want to do something for God. I, I kind of want to do something that echoes, you know, you know I'll, I'll just, I'll become a pastor. And so he becomes a pastor, but he wasn't, wasn't called at that time, anointed at that time. He was called to go into the marketplace. And so everything fell apart because he wasn't in his grace. He wasn't in his gift. He wasn't in his zone. So he, him and Melissa, when they, they came into to this house, they came in very, very broken. They came in two broken lives coming together. But God got a hold of them and, and Pathfinders and Marketplace and the seven pillars and, and they began to flourish and they began to, 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 to release their gifting and they began to prosper. And now they're pastors, but they're, they're pastors with a Marketplace expression. This guy says, I bought five yoke of oxen, five yoke of oxen. And I've got to go and test them. You know what oxen do? They put a plow behind the oxen and the oxen break up territory. They break up the ground. So you can go to a piece of ground that is just, it's just, it's rugged ground. It's got rocks and tree stumps and hard soil and clay and stones and stuff in it. But the, the, you, you get the, those, those oxen and they... They, 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 they break up the ground and, and they go back and forth and back and forth till the ground is completely ripped up and torn up so that it is now ready to put nitrates in there, ready to put fertilizer in there and ready to be the planting of seed. It might have just been barren dirt before, but now it's an oasis. Now it's an orchard. Now it's a vineyard. Now it's a garden. Now it reflects something that is beautiful, something that is majestic. You called to go into the marketplace because number two is producer. The second anointing that, that rests upon you if you're born again is to become a producer. And a producer is somebody who transforms communities, transforms society. You, you make things better. You make things better than what they were. When we came to San Diego, I knew that the anointing on us, wherever we put our footprint, is going to be better. You can tell a lot about the authority by the territory. In fact, the condition of the territory tells you who's in power. That's, that's why I have a lot of problem believing the stuff that the, the, the blue state leaders say, because I just look at the way that they govern their region. I look at the hopelessness. I look at the crime. I look at the murder rate. I look at the addiction rate. I look at the homelessness rate. And, and they're trying to pipe off like that. Well, first clean up your own mess. Jesus says, beware of false prophets. Beware of false teachers. You'll know them by their false prophecies and teaching. No, he says, you'll know them by their fruit. You'll know them by their fruit. Don't listen to the toot if the fruit's no good. Look at their fruit. You can tell, you can tell, you can tell the authority by the condition of the territory. The first time, the first time we drove into Tijuana, the first time we drove across, it, 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 was, it, was, such a, it was such a surreal experience because I'm looking, it's the same Pacific Ocean, it's just all of a sudden there's a border. And it's the same hillside and mountain, all of a sudden there's a border. It's the same sky. It was the same temperature. The same temperature on this side was the same temperature on this side. And yet here, order, peace, beautiful. As soon as we crossed over, disorder, poverty, chaos. What is it? It's the spirit that governs the region. You can tell the authority by the condition of the territory. Let me just double down now that you went all quiet. <laughs> Pastor Mike Connell has been, uh, Leanne and my, and now even for our team, one of the, the greatest pastors. And he was sharing with us just about pace and around uh, church life. And he told the story of where he, had a, he was right on the cusp of burnout with church and there was a split in the church and division in the church and all this kind of stuff and he had nothing left in the tank and they had no money, they were so poor. And so he just knew that he and his wife had to go away. They just had to take, take a week and just, just refresh. He had nothing left in the tank. And he said he, he, he had no energy, he couldn't even drive. So Joy, his wife had to drive and he said, I'm just gonna lay on the back seat and take a nap. And he was so exhausted, he fell asleep immediately. He said, and, you know, when you're asleep, you don't know time. He says, all of a sudden, he woke up and he had all this energy. And he thought, that's weird. Like, how did I? And he, so he sits up and he looks around and says, Joy, where are we? And she says, oh, um, we literally just crossed the county line. 
we just crossed the county line. And he said, huh. He said, it's interesting. As soon as I cross the county line, all of a sudden, all this energy. And he said, God, explain it. And God says, well, because I've anointed you to war for the region on the other side, because this is the region I've given you to govern, you're constantly in warfare. And as soon as you crossed the county line, that warfare is, the devil contends with you for that region. But the devil will leave you alone in this region because someone else is anointed there. That's why you immediately felt fresh. See, we need to be territory takers. But then when we take a territory, God is looking at how we, how we produce. What does it look like after you take it? What does it look like after you get your hands on it? We were in Israel a few years ago and, and we were driving from Jerusalem down to En Gedi. And we were gonna to go to Masada. Is that what it's called? Yeah. We're going, going to Masada and, and, and we're driving along. And, and I said, man, the last time I was here, I don't, man, I must have, I don't remember all these orchards. I don't remember all these beautiful date palms and citrus groves. I don't, and, and so our tour guide said, oh yeah, yeah. Um, because that used to belong, this is West Bank, that used to belong to the Palestinians. And so it was, it was barren. He says, today it, it, it returns about three point something billion in exports. We export the palms and the, the fruits and the, the pomegranates. We, we export, all the, or ex, export all the fruit. And I said, well, how come it was so barren before? He says, well, because in Islam, in, in Islam, they believe that Allah cursed the ground. And because, because Islam means literally slave, slave. They are slaves to Allah. So if he's cursed to just leave it alone. He says, but in Judaism, we know that God cursed the ground, but God blessed man. And so there's a war between what God cursed and what God blessed. And the blessing is always meant to overcome the curse. He says, so as soon as we got it, as soon as we got the land back, we immediately went into what was cursed and we began to sow seed and we began to sow seed. Under, under Islam, poverty. Under Islam, chaos. Under Judaism, flourishing. Garden, oasis, fruitful, abounding. You can tell a lot about an authority by the condition of the territory. You were created to flourish. In San Diego, I'm telling you, our assignment is to transform San Diego. You know what our job is? We, the reason we do Pathfinders is we want to release people with their five yoke of oxen, with their grace gifting, their grace anointing, to go into the marketplace and transform the marketplace, to pull out the roots and the rocks and the, the tree stumps and the weeds and transform the soil. So that when people say, my God, God, we need to move to San Diego. Marriages, there's something about marriages. They have the lowest divorce rate in all of America. Did you know that they have the lowest addiction rate? Did you know they have the highest prosperity rate? Did you know that their schools are rated some of the finest schools in the world? Did you know there, there's no CRT, there's no LGBTQ garbage being shoved down our kids' throats, but they're taught family values. They're taught biblical principles. They're taught how to honor the flag. And they're taught, that's what we're called to do. The second anointing is producer. The third one, the third one is the one where, I think it's verse 20, still another said, I have married a wife and therefore I cannot come. Oh, actually, can I just jump back onto point two? I'm out of time though. I want to show you something, I want to show you something, I want to show you something. All right, this is back on point two. Point two, producer, 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 producer. The Bible is not just a history book. The Bible is not just a history book. People want you to believe that it's just a book of history, but it's not because the Bible is written outside of time. So it is written out, so absolutely it has captured history. But the Bible is also a prophetic book because everything in here is on a complete repeat cycle. The reason the devil doesn't want you to read the Bible is because if you read the Bible, you'll discover patterns and you'll detect him and you'll dismiss him. So he doesn't want you reading this because you'll see. So, so watch this, watch this. There's a man in Israel in the book of Judges called Samson. Samson is anointed by God. He's anointed by God. And he keeps whooping the Philistines. No matter where he goes, he whoops them. And, 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 and the Bible says that the children of Israel come to him and say, well, what are you doing? 
Don't you know that the, the Philistines rule over us? Why are you messing with it? Just, just accept that these people are in power and we just got to submit to the government and we just got to, Samson won't do it. So they made, they made a deal with the enemy. They made a deal with the, that they're going to hand him over to the Philistines. And you know the story, Spirit breaks the ropes like flax and he picks up the jawbone of a donkey and just goes to town. Just, just bam, busting heads. <laughs> heads busting everywhere. You got these Philistines, like there's thousands of them. They're all lined up and all they see is <laughs> heads exploding. And they're back here going, yeah, what's happening up there? I'm not sure. Because they speak with a Scottish accent, apparently, in <laughs> Palestine. <laughs> what's, he, what's he doing? Oh, it looks like he's busting heads. <laughs> what's he got in his hand? It looks like the jawbone of a donkey's ass. I mean, a jawbone of a... No, hang on. What is it? A jawbone of a... Anyway, jawbone of an ass or jo- whatever. Anyway, jawbone of a donkey. Not a donkey's... Anyway, and so that's awkward. Anyway, you know the story. Stop interrupting me. I'm trying to finish. I'm over time. So, so watch this. So finally, you know the Delilah, D- Delilah story, Delilah story. And they were asking, we want to know the secret to his strength. We want to know the secret to his strength. When she shaves his head and the Spirit of the Lord leaves him, his strength had left him. The strength, the anointing left him. The first thing they did was board out both of his eyes. The first thing they did was took away his vision. Once, once they broke his strength, his ability to resist the governing corrupt authority. Once he lost his strength to resist and overcome, they took away his vision. Next, what they did, Pastor Alex, was they then put him into the field to grind their corn. He's grinding their wheat. He's just put out there to grind. And then the Bible says that they would give him relief from grinding their corn and their wheat by bringing him out to perform. This is a picture of the spirit of the world compared to the spirit of the kingdom. The spirit of the world wants to take your strengths to resist because it wants to take away a God vision for your life put you in the in the field where you work to make Bill Gates, you work to make Bezos, you worked for the elites, you work for, for them, you work to produce wealth for them. You're not producing wealth for you, you're not producing wealth for the kingdom and the entire thing is performance based, not in the kingdom. In the kingdom, everything rises and falls on your productivity for God. God wants you to keep your strength. He wants you to live with a God vision and He wants you to produce for the kingdom. That's what I needed to get in. All right, the last one, the last one, the last one, the last one. He says, I've married a wife, therefore I cannot come. The third anointing, the third flow, the third element of being invited, the lesson that we learn is God looks for promise keepers. This this is a man who says, I've married a wife. He's a man who can make a promise and keep it. He, he's, he's a man that doesn't just make a promise. He, he goes from promise to covenant. There are a lot of people that make a commitment, but a lot of people say that marriage is a contract. Marriage isn't a contract. Marriage isn't a contract. It's not a certificate and it's not a contract. It's a covenant. What's the difference between a covenant, a certificate and a contract? In a contract, it's a contractual agreement. A contractual agreement says, well, if you do A, B and C, I'll bring D, E and F to the table. And you'll receive D, E, and F as long as A, B, and C, if A, B, and C it falls short, well, I'm going to withhold D, E, and F. So if you said to me, what's the greatest way for me to ruin my marriage? Think of it as a contract. Jesus on the cross made a covenant. He says, take this wine. This is the wine of the new covenant, my blood. When Jesus hung on the cross, you didn't have to bring anything to the table. A covenant is, I will be faithful, I will be loyal, I will cleanse, I will deliver, I will heal, I will redeem, I will restore. Doesn't matter what you do. But when you come to Him and He begins to heal 
and He begins to save and He begins to restore, everything shifts. Everything changes. This is a man who, like Pastor Mike Finn, saw the most beautiful woman in San Diego, Rachel. And he thought, how do I win her? So like Paul, he sat with Paul Church when he said, Paul, you got to give me some of your tricks. Now, if I was honest with you, you know, Paul charging him 10 grand, I felt, I felt that was a bit steep. Little see, but Paul's a businessman. He's a marketplace giant. You got to, you got to. So he, he said, to, he said, look, here's some tricks that work for me with Audrey. But Mike knew that he had to, to woo her. He had to win her. He had to court her. Then the day came, the day came where he's smitten. He's head over heels with his beautiful Rachel. So then he makes an appointment to see her daddy. And he asked her daddy, I really love your daughter. Would you give me permission to have her hand in marriage? Hand in marriage is, it's an old English term. It's an old English tradition where a man says, I, I spent money and I bought a ring. And when people see her left hand, they see no, no, no ring on there. It says that she's still available. Sir, I'm in love with your daughter. She's in love with me. Please, may I put a ring? May I have her hand in marriage? He doesn't get her whole, he just gets her hand in marriage. The time is coming where he gets all of Rachie, but right now it's the hand of marriage. And he says, yes. So then he goes through, but then there comes a day and they stand at an altar. The doors open and this angel in white comes walking in. Mikey Fan is standing there and he makes vows and they exchange vows, promises before men, promises before God. They kiss and they're declared husband and wife. And they start this beautiful journey, this beautiful adventure together. That's how life's meant to be. Life's meant to be filled with people that make promises, but they don't just make contractual agreements. They don't even just make commitments. They take contractual agreements and commitments and they put it into a covenant that I will be your friend come hell or high water. One of the things that we learn in 2020 was there were a lot of people who today, now 2023, now that the storm subsided, are all of a sudden our friends. They, 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 they weren't there in 2020, 21, 22. Some of you even got back to us, you know, didn't say kind things about us. And the Holy Spirit's so beautiful. The Holy Spirit just fell on me and He just said, people aren't making their best choices. Don't judge them. People aren't making their best decisions. Don't judge them. One of the most beautiful things is to love somebody when they're not doing the right thing. Peter denies Jesus three times and Annika just captured it so brilliantly. When you see the three angels carry on, carry on my way with Psalm, there'll be peace when you are done. About the restoration of someone, he denied Jesus three times, but Jesus never denied him. Jesus never quit on him. Jesus never gave up on him. It's called a promise keeper. The Bible says, who can ascend to the hill of the Lord? The Bible says, he who has clean hands and innocent heart and he who swears to his own hurt. When we were moving to San Diego in 2005, we moved here in July. In May of 2005, Pastor Phil Pringle had a Vision Builders and we had $10,000 left on our Vision Builders and I was meant to have got a check from my book publisher for my book, God in Hollywood. And it hadn't come, it was meant to arrive before the, the date. And so I'm sitting there at the dinner, I'm sweating. And then Pastor Phil kind of gave a little bit of reprieve. He said, listen, if you still owe 10 grand, oh, sorry, if you still owe money from last year, just roll it over and make it part of your new pledge. And I thought, oh, that's fantastic. And I said to Liam, look, we're going to San Diego. We weren't really gonna give because we're like, we need every cent for church planning. I said, but I just wanna honor Pastor Phil. What, 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 what do you think we, we, we do another 10,000 and even while we're in San Diego and just believe God. And Leah's like, yes, I think we should honour. So we, we put another 10. So we took the 10 from there. As I'm writing it, my phone blows up my, and I look and it's the publisher saying, tomorrow a check's coming and I'll be able to cover the 10 grand. I'm like, oh my gosh, that's fantastic. So I put the 20. The next day, the 10 grand came in and I went down to, to, to Glenn Henry, who was the accountant, and I gave him the 10. I explained to him, I explained to him. I said, you know, last night the 10 left over and the new 10, 20, and then here's the 10. So now it's from 20, it's down to 10, so I owe 10. He's like, yeah, yeah I understand, because he's an accountant. He understands, he understands. But that Sunday, that Sunday in church, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm in church and Pastor Phil's, you know, he's kind of doing his thing for Vision Builder Sunday. And then all of a sudden he goes, hey, yeah, 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 youth guy, youth guy, come up here. 
Yeah, get up here, youth guy. I'm like, ah, oh, oh, Jürgen. Yeah, yeah, whatever, whatever. And he's punching me. He's like, yeah, yeah, this is our youth guy. I'm like, it's Jürgen. Yeah, yeah, whatever. And he's punching me. And so he's like, yeah, this guy, this guy, going to church planning. No, no, he didn't fulfill his vision builder's pledge from last year, but he's given another 20 next year. And I was just about to say, oh, that's not, you know, it's not exactly, and, but, and, and, the, and people stood and started clapping. Started, and I'm thinking, well, far be it from me to rob these people of their joy right now. <laughs> like, I don't, wanna, I don't wanna ruin Pastor Phil's celebration. I, I'll, I'll just receive all the accolades and drink in all the adoration and award. And then after, afterwards, I'll explain it. So, so Leanne's like, oh, well, you know, you're on the hook for 20. I said, babe, babe, I'm not. I've already talked with the accountant. I said, I know math's not your thing. And I said, here's 20. I said, I t-. and here's the, and so, yeah, exactly. You can see where this is going. And so she's like, no, I don't care what you say. You made a commitment for 20. You've got to come up with, I'm like, babe, talk to the accountant. I put 10, this 10 lips. She goes, I don't care what you say. When you were up on that stage, you received all the, it, you, it looked like you made a promise. I'm like, babe, I can explain it on paper. She goes, I don't care what you say. So we moved to San Diego. 18 months later, we have a piece of land that has fallen out of escrow three times, costing us $4,800 a month. I'm watching the bank account whittle away. It keeps falling out of escrow. It goes, we have a fourth offer. I'm like, finally, finally. And then it falls out of escrow again. So now I'm ticked. I've got, I look at my bank account. I've got like 11,400. I don't even have three payments left. And I'm like, how am I gonna do this? And so I, I get up and I go for a walk. I'm like, God, come on. I'm over here building your church and getting people saved. And the least you can do is show this flipping piece of land. Like, how hard is it? And I'm, you know, I'm giving it to God. It's 4.30 in the morning. No one else is around. So I'm just quite candid. And so, so, so I'm waiting for God to respond. No response. No response. I'm like, I'm, not, like, I'm already at another level. Like, I'm, you know, I'm agitated. And so I just said, I just said, oh, you know, I'm going to. I said, God, the heck's wrong with people? Four times, seriously? Four times people make an offer and then they they back out? How come people can't follow through on their commitment? (laughs) It was too late. Holy Spirit showing him, holds up a mirror. I'm like, oh, crap. So I walk home and wake Leanne. Honey, you were right again. I knew I married Miss Wright. I just wish her first name wasn't always. <laughs> so I went to my account, true story, pulled out the entire amount, sent it to Australia. And I thought, well, here we go. Foreclosure's about to go, about to start getting letters from the bank. I don't know. Within 48 hours, I get a phone call from the very, very first realtor who's no longer con- contracted as our realtor who says, hey, look, I just looked up, your land is still available. The first guy that offered on your, he had to pull out because his deal fell through. He just got an all cash offer. He called me to see if your land's still available. And I said, it is. There's been offers, but for whatever reason, he didn't take those offers. I wanted to say, well, they fell out of escrow, but I didn't. And so, so he thought, wow, he must be really holding out. Ask him if he'll take 200,000 more than the original price. So as a man of God, I said, let me pray about it. Amen. Amen. It, was the fast, it was the fastest prayer, fastest prayer I've ever prayed. Coincidence? No. What God blesses is promise keepers. He who swears to his own hurt. The Bible says a man is snared by the words of his mouth. Now let me just close the story guy is a territory taker he's a producer and he's a promise keeper but they use that as excuses to miss the greatest banquet don't let the things of this world don't let the anointings that's going to make you successful in taking territory or successful in transforming communities and being a producer don't, don't make you know covenant relationships don't let any of those things rob you from eternity with God. Seek first the kingdom and His righteousness. Come on, why don't we stand to our feet? Stand to our feet. 
Can I just ask you this question as you stand to your feet? If you're here today and you're saying, you know what? I hear the invitation by God to be in His family, to be in His kingdom, to have everlasting life. And I want to accept that invitation. Would you raise your hand? Because I'm going to say a prayer for you. I'm going to pray for you. Who are those ones? You can hear God saying, today I hear the invitation. I hear the invitation. I'm not missing the invitation. I'm coming into the kingdom. Thank you. Thank you. Who else is there? Quickly, would you raise your hand? Thank you through there. Thank you, sweetheart. I see your hand. Who else is there? Lift it high. Thank you through there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. I see that hand. Who else is there? Who else is there? Thank you, young man. I see your hand. Who else is there? Saying, Pastor, that's me. Pastor, that's me. Thank you up there. Who else is there? Just lift it up high. Lift it up high. Say, I know we're we're, we're over time and I promise you I'm going to pray in in about 15 seconds. Is there one more saying, I need to respond. I don't want to miss. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Who else is there? Who else is there? Thank you. Thank you. Let's all say these words out loud. Say, Heavenly Father, I thank you today. You sent Jesus, your only son, to die on the cross to redeem me from all my sin. Today I am forgiven. I thank you. I am delivered from all the power of the devil. His hold over my life is completely broken. I am free. I am forgiven. I am clean. I am a child of God. Heaven is my home. God is my Father. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Amen. Those of you that raise your hands. We have gifts we want to give you. We want to give you a Bible and a following Jesus book. Down here we have some people that are going to be at the doors. Make sure you get one. If you would have raised your hand knowing we're giving free stuff away, go and see them. They're going to give it to you. If you brought someone that raised their hand or needed to, go and get them a Bible and a following Jesus book. I'm going to hand back right now to Pastor Mike Finn. We love you. I got a feeling that that Hero may be sold out, but if not, get in there. The last two shows, let's let's not let them perform to one empty seat. Let's pack this place out. Let's cheer them across the finish line. They've worked so hard. We love you. God bless you. Thank you, Mike. Wow. What an amazing word. I hope you enjoyed that as much as I did. Hey, listen, for more information about our church, go to www.awakenchurch.com or subscribe to our YouTube channel if you haven't already, and download our app. It is amazing. It is chock full of incredible messages about upcoming events, and you can even support our ministry if you feel so inclined. We loved having you with us today. We look forward to seeing you again. God bless you. Live a life that is transformative. Bye for now.